Good afternoon. I'm Ariana Cohen Halverstam. I'm the Artistic Director of Boston Jewish Film. Welcome to our 32nd Annual Festival and to our conversation this afternoon about Syndrome K. I'm so pleased to be here together with the film's director, Stephen Edwards. Stephen, welcome. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. So we were just chatting a little bit before um, before we went live, and there's so much to talk about in this film. Um, it's such an incredible story, one that I hadn't known until I'd seen your film. Um, you're, you've made one other film um, that, took, that I just learned was shot in Vatican City. Um, how did you come to this, to this story? So it's kind of amazing. So in 2017, I was basically uh, killing time on Facebook and two friends of mine who are also musicians posted this little story about Syndrome K. And I noticed it because one of them was a, a Roman uh, composer friend of mine. So I clicked on it and it was like, oh yeah, Syndrome K, fake disease, Rome, Nazi occupation. I'm like, wow, this is fascinating. So I read the two paragraph story and I said, oh, I'm, there's gotta be a documentary film. So I went to Amazon, Netflix, DirecTV, YouTube, and I said, there's gotta, somebody has to, this story is just too good. Somebody has to have made a movie. And there was nothing, I couldn't believe it. So I immediately contacted my uh, editor on my last film and I said, you know, you've got to check this story out. This is too good. And he's like, yeah, absolutely. So everything started moving very quickly. Um, I knew that Borromeo Sr., the head of the hospital, had passed away in 1961. And Dr. Sacerdoti, who was the Jewish doctor, had passed away somewhere around 2000. We actually still don't know when he passed. I still haven't found any um, record on him. And then the other one was Dr. Ozicini, who was the really old gentleman in the interview. We knew he was born in 21, but we couldn't find 1921, but we couldn't find a death notice on him, which I thought was really strange. And so I looked around and I found out he was still alive, 98 years old, living in Rome. And I said, oh, I'm going tonight. I'm going to fly right now and go interview him. So we had to get the wheels in motion. I found a, a Roman Jew who is also a journalist who's done a little bit of, uh, in, you know, done a little bit of digging about the story. And I contacted her and I said, would you be willing to interview him? She said, absolutely. Yes. So I booked flight, flew over. Um, and we got the two Soninos, Gabrielle and Giacomo Sonino, our survivors. So we got them lined up and then we got Osicini lined up. I flew over. We spent a week shooting and here we are. So amazing, serendipity. So, and the other interviews that with the um, doctors who had already passed, um, where, did you, where did you find those interviews? So the interview with Dr. Sacerdoti comes from Shoah Foundation. So, um, and that's just, I can't even stress how huge that is because um, it's the only piece of information of anything that Sacerdoti ever wrote down or gave to anybody. And we we can only find, I mean, we scoured, we can only find four pictures of the guy anywhere. Plus an interview, this interview was five 20 minute tapes where he tells his whole life story. So it was absolute, for us, it was absolute gold. It actually made the movie. And, you know, he's the Jew who practiced medicine at a Catholic hospital using a fake name, you know, saving members of his own family. I mean, it's just like, how, I mean, how much better of a film, I mean, the greatest villains in the history of film Nazis, you know, heroes that were saving people they don't know. Like, if I can't make a, you know, a compelling story out of this, I should go, <laughs> I should go flip burgers somewhere. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just, too, it's just too good. It's so. an incredible story. And, and at, w at what point did you decide to incorporate in, uh, reenactments into the film? And, and how did you get Ray Liotta involved in the project? So, um, so two things, reenactments, we knew we had such precious little footage to deal with. And some of those, like the, uh, the footage of the, um, of the deportation, that comes from a very famous movie called Rome Open City, mm -hmm. directed by Roberto Rossellini, which was the first big Italian film in the United States. It was like, that film was kind of a, a minor hit in the States. It was made in 1946. And um, it really paved the way for all the spaghetti Westerns. It paved the way, I mean, it, it changed the whole face of Italian cinema. It still stands up today. It's worth, it's worth a watch. And yeah. so we licensed some clips from that, you know, that are actually shot right after the, right after the liberation. Um, so, and then, the, you know, the rest, we just had to reenact because there was no, no other way to tell the story. You know, there's animation, there's um, 
I actually had one shot that I shot in my front yard in my house with two SS soldiers. And I got a lot of very funny looks from my neighbors, including my Jewish neighbor across the street who sent me a text and said, the next time you have the SS over, could you give me a little bit of notice? For <laughs> but it was not a, not a usual sight in Southern not a California. Usual sight, it, I told, I reassured him it was reenactment and it, we were good. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, it had to be a, a kind of a pastiche combination. And the film is actually going to be seen in all of Europe, Middle East, Asia, and probably on PBS in the United States. And the, fil the version that's going to be seen is actually cut down. It's only a 52 minute version. Okay. which doesn't include a lot of the story about Alberto Lordi and the massacre. It's just more of a linear story about what happened to the Jews and how the, how the U.S. Army had to, you know, free and liberate Rome. It, uh, it is an incredible story, and I'm glad that it's going to be seen across the world. Is it a story that's remembered in Italy? Um, so that's a great they... question. So, uh, you know, because when you, every time I talk to somebody about it, including you in this conversation, they go, oh, that's a cool story. I've never heard about it. And I said, well, I've talked to maybe, I don't know, a thousand people about this. And I think one person had known about it somehow. Mm -hmm. You know, we went to the, we walked around the Jewish ghetto, which is literally 200 meters from the hospital after doing the interviews. And we talked to the elders who have lived there their whole lives and they'd never heard the story. Wow. So, you know, these doctors didn't go around crowing about the great thing they did. You know, they just didn't, they didn't, you know, it wasn't their style. And so we, you know, that's why the story stayed dormant for 75 years until I just found it. And I said, oh, this is, this story needs to be shared. So, I mean, everybody says, I, you know, I, it's almost like a cliche that I go, oh, this is a great story. You know, two doctors, three doctors, you know, fake disease, save the Jews. And, and they go, well, I've never heard of that. I go, well, welcome to the club. <laughs> you know I mean? No, nobody's heard of this story. That's what's so, that's what's so gold about it. Oh, by the way, Ray Liotta, I forgot to tell you Ray Liotta. Do you want me to tell that now? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I, I do think that's the line you opened the film with is the, um, is, I don't, I didn't do this for recognition. So and I think that's it, that it sets the tone be, of why nobody knows about it. It's, it couldn't be, and you know, these guys were just, um, you know, they just did what they thought was the right thing. And, you know, let's be honest, they took the entire hospital staff's lives into their own hands by doing it because we know what the reprisals from, from Nazis were. I mean, we don't, I don't need to catalog that for anybody. Um, so it was a, you know, a giant risk. And, you know, they but just- nothing. How did they try, I mean, that's, that's something I hadn't, I hadn't considered and I, and I do want to hear about Ray Liotta. Um, but, but did you hear from anyone in, on the hospital staff what, I mean, there must've been everyone from security guards to janitor, or, you know, all the people who work in a hospital, were they aware of what was going on and, and what was, you know, how did, how, do they trust everybody there? I, that's a great question. My, my takeaway from it is they, it was a need to know basis. And so if they had a patient in the hospital, they didn't delineate whether or not they were Jewish. Um, but I'm sure several folks in the hospital knew. And, you know, remember the hospital was also, there was a lot of clandestine stuff going on. They had a clandestine radio <laughs> in the basement. Um, Alberto Lordi was doing stuff there. I mean, you know, there was not a lot of love lost for the Nazis from this hospital and from the staff. Let's just be honest, you know? So they were doing everything they could without, you know, there's a story that I, I was going to incorporate into the film, but it just didn't have contextually the right flavor. And it's basically when it got, you know, it got really bad in Rome. It was like a third world country. People were starving. Um, two, th two little anecdotes. Rome is known for having its stray cats. Like if you go to the Coliseum right now, there's cats walking around. Well, during this period, no more cats. So you can get an idea what wow. happened to cats, right? That's how bad it was. And um, there was one situation where these 10 women broke into an SS bakery and stole flour, yeast, all the materials for making bread. The SS caught them, lined them up on the Tiber and machine gun. So I didn't put it in the movie because it's you know, nobody needs to hear about atrocities because there were so many atrocities, but that was what could have happened to these guys. They would have, you know, they would have been very severe for all these, for the staff, even the staff that didn't know, you know? Right. Um, I mean, it, 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 we're, I think that, in a, that we're in a moment where we're really recognizing the heroism of doctors who take Hippocratic oaths and 
um, this film feels timely partially for that reason. Yeah, and uh, you know, let's not forget, I made a film about a fake disease in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. Which is like, look, I was, you know, I wasn't setting out to do that, but it's kind of funny, right? I mean, ironic, not funny, but ironic that now we have a, a story about a disease that actually saved lives. Right. And we all know what quarantine means better than ever before. Yeah. Um, I, I want to talk, let's let's talk about Ray Liotta and there are okay. audience questions coming in as well. And I do want you to talk a little bit also about the Roman Jewish community. So okay, sure. let's start with, with uh, so Ray. Ray. So my daughter, Bella, who just graduated from Emerson in Boston, by the way, and we were talking before, she misses Boston. She wishes she was there. I wish I could be there with you all because I love visiting there. We do too. Um, so my daughter, Bella, went to high school with Carson Leota, who's Ray's daughter. Carson's a year younger. So when I was looking for a narrator, I had a friend who knew Robert De Niro and Al Pacino's agent, who actually happens to be the same guy. So I said, let's get, you know, let's get De Niro Pacino to narrate this. It would be awesome. So he goes, they're not going to do it. Like, said, let's just ask. So he goes, he's, you're going to send him an email and he's going to just ignore you and you're never going to hear back. So I sent an email to De Niro and Pacino's agent. 20 minutes later, he gets back to me. He goes, this is a great story. They would be thrilled to do it, but they wouldn't do a, a narration on a doc that they didn't produce. Mm -hmm. Thanks, but no thanks. So I was like, okay. I said, but I know Ray. And probably my favorite piece of narration of top three of all time it's Shawshank Redemption Morgan Freeman it's Ray Liotta at the beginning of Goodfellas and there's maybe two or three others that are just uh -huh. that great that transcendentally great so I emailed so I'd met Ray a few times socially because of school so I sent Ray an email and I go hey Steve Edwards blah 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 how's it going you know I'm Bella's dad and you know they're really close and would you be interested in doing this? So unbeknownst to me, I sent him that email while he was at the Toronto Film Festival with um, Noah Baumbach's movie about divorce. Marriage Story. Marriage Story, thank you. And he was sitting in the audience for the screening and next to him was Carson. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so he looks at it on his phone, he goes, oh, I just got this email from Steve Edwards, Bella's dad, and he wants, you know, he wants me to narrate the film. She goes, you have to do it. <laughs> oh my God, that's Bella's dad. You have to do it. So he's like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and he lived close by. He came down, he did the whole thing in three hours. He's just oh, wow. amazing, amazing to work with. Super funny. You know, um, it just, it, it was one of the highlights. I mean, we just had such a, I mean, we sat down, me and the editor and the writer sat down and watched the beginning of Goodfellas again. And we just looked at each other. <laughs> oh my God, if we can get this guy to narrate this film, it's just like, really? And he said, yes. so. That's amazing. Um, I'm going to start with some audience questions. Sure. There's there's one here. Um, Thank you for making this amazing film. It was really interesting. There was mention of the Black aristocracy. Can you explain what this was? Um, also, is the hospital still wor a working hospital and can it be toured? Yes, 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 yes. So this is so cool. So Fatih Beni Fratelli, which is 200 meters from the Jewish ghetto on Tiber Island, is very, very much an active hospital in Rome. And the cool part is Dr. Ozzuccini, who is our elderly doctor, his daughter is a doctor there right now. She's oh, in her wow. 50s. And we actually interviewed her. There wasn't really anything that she told us that wasn't better told by her dad. But his doctor, to, his daughter to this day is still uh, still practicing at the hospital. Um, so that, so fat's a bit of, fat, you can, sure. I'm not sure about the tours. I went back and there was, there's, you know, it's a, it's like going into Cedar Sinai. I mean, it's a, it's an active hospital. So there's, they have one little plaque, which I think is in the film. I can post a picture of it. Like it says, the House of. Uh, yeah, I believe that is in the film. House of what do they call it again? It's the, um, oh my brain. It's the, it, um, righteous. Oh, it's a righteous house of something. Oh, from. Of, from, of righteous it's, saviors, yeah. Yeah, it's the Israel. Yeah. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. From Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem, thank you. Yeah, so Yad Vashem gave them a plaque. Uh, righteous people, a house of something. God, I can't remember what it is. But anyway, I have a picture of it somewhere. So that, and the Black aristocracy, my best understanding was, it was sort of an elite group that had direct, um, direct uh, influence on Vatican policy and the Holy See. So they were sort of a elite, um, wealthy, influential political arm 
that was very, very much, as far as I can tell, anti-Nazi, anti-German. Anti and that's that saved um, many people, you know, through the film. Yeah, I mean, it uh, was, you know, it was a group effort. There was a lot of groups that hated them. And, you know, you don't need, I mean, let's think about it. Italians, like, I, I'm Italian, so I can, I can speak to this. If you piss off an Italian, it's not going to go well for you. And think about it, it's called Syndrome K. They named it after the head of the SS, Kapler, and the, head, the German general that Hitler sent to occupy Rome, Kesselring. Like, if that's not a big F you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, that's so Italian. I just love, I mean, there's so many things in the first minute when I saw the story that just hooked me in. I just, I couldn't believe, like, that takes some, that's chutzpah right there. Yeah. That, right? I mean, Absolutely. I'm, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's so blatant under their noses. Yeah. yeah. I'm literally. Um, Mark, Mark Silver um, clarified for us. It was, it's righteous, am, right, righteous Among the Nations from Yad Thank Hashem. You. Yeah. And it, um, if, I, if I show you this picture, it's right there on the plaque. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Daniel Berman said, this particular documentary film moved me to tears with this overall story. So I did want to share that. There's Thank a good you. question from Dr. Leora Fishman. Did the hospital have to document deaths to account for patients leaving? To convents or wherever, um, and do we know if the Nazis checked in on this? Good question. Um, as far as I know, they didn't declare them dead. Um, what my understanding was is that they gave them fake identities and sent them to convents and other places, um, and just kind of slipped them through there. So sometimes they would stay for four or five days. We have we still don't know how many people we're talking about. And by the way, there's a second hospital that was doing this also, mm. which we didn't, you know, we figure we, one hospital is enough. The story is a story. We're trying to make a film and we're trying to get the story in in a short amount of time over nine months. But um, yeah, there was a lot of shuffling going on. And again, it's so Italian. Like, oh, yeah, here's some fake papers. Uh, your name is now well, Sacerdote became Salviucci, right? Mm. And that's what they did. They changed people's names and just gave them new identities and then shuffled them through and then right under their noses. And they, I think they caught a few of them, but most of them got away. You were saying earlier that um, before we got on that Sacerdote means Cohen um, in Italian. And obviously, you know, Jews have a long history in Italy and Rome, particularly. Oh, yeah. And of course, you talk about how in 1938, the, there was the creation of the ghetto. Can you talk a little bit about what the relationship was between the Jewish community in Rome and the Catholic community before 1938? Yeah, so um, as far as I know about the Jewish ghetto in Rome, I think it was created, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Um, so I don't think it was created in 38. 38, my, my relationship to the year 1938 is that was when the race laws kicked in. And then you could no longer teach, you could no longer be a doctor, you could only treat Jews. That's what Sacerdote happened. That's what happened to Sacerdote. Um, and then as far as the relationship with the, the Jewish community in Rome, it's a really long, uh, interesting story. Um, it's been contentious. Uh, it wasn't fun to be a Jew in Rome for a while. Um, I think um, during the war, you know, people really stood up and basically said, you know, I mean, there's, there was a guy, Rab Rabbi Zoller. Rabbi Zoller was the head of the Jewish community in Rome. And obviously when the Nazis came in, and when they went to occupy places, the first thing they would do is target the intellectuals and try to kill them first. So he went into hiding with somebody, I'm not gonna remember his name, and they never caught him. And then the really ironic part was after the war, he converted to Catholicism, mm -hmm. which obviously I'm sure the community was, I would, if I was in that community, I'd be devastated. But anyway, that's what he did. And apparently he was pretty tight with uh, Pius XII. They were friends. So, um, you know, it's a checkered past with the relationship of, of the Jews, but my little window of time, what I saw was they really looked up for their fellow man, regardless of who they were and what they were. That's my observation. That's what I love about the story. It's a long <laughs> history. It's 2000 years. Like I was right. telling you before we started, Ariel Piatelli, who was my, um, she's a a Jewish journalist based in Rome. And she's the one that conducted the interviews that you saw. And I said, well, how long has your family been in Rome? She said, 2000 years. It's hard for Americans. Like I live in LA, like you can't find a building that's a hundred years old. Right. And, and 
just the the length of history is just it's just they call the Jews in Rome. One priest told me they call them the original Romans. Mm. Kind of interesting. Interesting. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you did bring up Pope Pius, and and I think that's definitely an interesting thing that you touch on in the film is is that there are some questions around um, around his role during the war, and you know, you say he did he did some things, but not everything, right? And and there's a, there's actually a question here from the audience, and and I would love for you to talk more about Pope sure. Pius. Um, sure. Will the Catholic? The question is if the Catholic Church might use this film to sort of get Pope Pius off the hook in this story. Um, what is what is the conversation around Pope Pius today? That's such a great question. I've never thought of. Will the Church use it to get him off the hook? It, I'll tell you, from till right now, till today, I've had absolutely no reaction from the Catholic Church whatsoever. I'm a Catholic, by the way. I, that's, I grew up Catholic. The, re, the reaction I've gotten from the Jewish community has been unbel, unbelievable. I mean, this is like the 12th festival I've played. I, I think what will happen is when it gets out there, I think the, the Catholic community will embrace it, um, which I find just really interesting. It's just like, it, I don't know, maybe it's just, it's a, I don't know. It, that's just been my experience. I've made one Holocaust film and I'm probably not going to make another one. <laughs> But anyway, um, Pius XII is a really interesting, controversial subject, but a multi-layered, multi-tiered um, conversation. We have to remember that if you think of Vatican City, Vatican City is a sovereign country that is surrounded by Rome. Vatican City is the size of an 18-hole golf course, right? So think of a country club, that's the size of Vatican City. I can walk around it in 12 minutes. Um, the Pope had no army. The Pope had a lot of political influence. And um, he was trying to be the Pope for all the Catholics worldwide. So there was a lot of political stuff going on. And remember, he was a nuncio in Germany. So he spent a lot of time in Germany. He, he understood the, sort of the, now this is pre-Hitler, of course. Um, but, you know, he had no army. So when, when the deportation happened and those thousand people were deported, which most of them never came back, there was only a certain amount he could do because there were so many severe reprisals when Catholics and bishops spoke out in other countries. He was aware of priests getting killed, bishops getting killed. Um, so he had to be very careful. Um, and there is also, there is also some, some chatter floating around that he was anti-Semitic. I've never seen any evidence of that. Um, and I, he didn't speak out about it, but I think he knew it was going on. And the reason I think he knew is there was even, there's a place called Casa Gandolfo, which is his summer residence. It's kind of like Camp David for the president. Mm -hmm. uh, it's his, and there were, there were Jewish families hiding there. So he knew, he had to know, but he couldn't broadcast that he knew. And I think he kind of, the underlings kind of were um, cooperating. And that's just my takeaway from it. No, that's as far as I can tell. Now, the archives that are being opened up, Pius XII's archives, and there could be something where he says, there could be some memo he wrote that says, geez, I hope they get rid of all the Jews in Rome. I mean, we haven't seen any evidence of it, but my thing, and it, when I saw that, I'm like, well, I don't want to be involved in a film where, you know, that happened. But then the other side of it was like, well, wouldn't it be even more extraordinary if the Pope was against it and these people went against those orders and to save these people? So I was like, okay, either way, it's extraordinary, the story. And my feeling is he knew about it and he, you know, he just had to sort of skate that really thin line, that risky line, you know. Did any of the Jews you spoke to in, in interviewing for this film talk about Pope Pius and their feelings? Do you know what the feeling of the Jewish community well, in Ozzie Rome Gini, is? Ozicini certainly talked about it. And he was pretty, he was like, you know, he didn't do enough. Like, he just like, he could have done a lot more. This is a Catholic talking. And, you know, okay, he's right, you know, but what what would that be? How, I mean, is he gonna give a bunch of carbines to a bunch of Carmelite nuns and have them start attacking 1500 SS troops that were occupying Rome? You know, like what, you know, and then, you know, remember that the, the allies had crossed over into Southern Italy and they were moving up to Rome. They thought they were gonna be there in a couple of weeks and it took them nine months. So I think he, everybody miss, uh, miscalculated how brutal that war was going to be. And remember, right. there were 9,000 casualties. I, I, think, I think the interesting thing about the film is that it is, we see 
it's it's an incredible story of of interfaith sort of one group helping another um yeah. and you know pope pius obviously was in a place of power and i think one of the things that i think is as and I, i'm curious to hear what you what you hope comes out of this film but i think it, it does implore us um to look out for our neighbors in a way yeah um, That's what i love about the story too i mean because it's yeah. risky you know it's i think all of us would acknowledge it was it was risky what they did you know and we all know Absol what the reprisals absolutely are, you know? Uh, there's a question here. Are you working? Uh, what are you working on next in terms of filmmaking or composing? So um, filmmaking, we're trying to make a feature version of Syndrome K. And I was joking, half joking, but half serious with you when we were, before we started. I think this makes a better movie than it makes a documentary. It's just so compelling. If you know, get, you think. So we've got uh, a director on board. We've got a script, and we hope to make this film next year. And it's going to go on. You know, it'll go on Netflix, Amazon somewhere and we're really excited about it and so yeah. the director's been pouring over he was just pouring over the sacerdote interviews yesterday um we're crafting a really cool you know feature film that's so. amazing the characters are just I, i'm really looking forward to seeing how oh it's just develop. too good i mean italians just you know thumbing up their nose at nazis is just it's just so good to me it's just like it's just it's just it's gonna be great i think i'm excited and and where is this film going next? You said it, it's going to be on PBS and we we're talking to PBS right now, and then we've got deals all over Europe, all over the Middle East, all over Asia. So there's a 52 minute version of this movie that's going to be seen on TV worldwide, and it's screening at our festival, of course, until yeah. November 15th. Um, is there anything else you want to share about what you've learned about the Jewish community in Rome and, and sort of where their relationship is today with the Catholic community? And Well, I think it's, um, you know, I think one thing that happened was um, there was a, the Jewish community in the, in the Jewish ghetto in the 40s was, was pretty much, um, I, they were all kind of inside the ghetto. And then when the, when the deportation happened, they all spread out and hid. Um, and I think today... The Jewish ghetto is still sort of the the informal home of the Roman Jews, but I think Jews in Rome live all over now, and there's no there's no problem, and they're accepted, and they seem to get along. There was a there was a reach out from uh, Pope Paul, Pope John Paul II, where he went to the he went to the um, synagogue, and everybody was you know it was kumbaya. So, I'm my takeaway is that the the, the relationship now is is good, it's strong. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I do think it's just amazing that it's a community that's been there for 2000 years that um, preserve has preserved a really um, unique Jewish culture too. For sure, for sure. And, and on top of the infrastructure of the seat and the home of the Catholic church for the entire world, you know, it's a billion people. So, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's a neat compliment. It's, it's, a, it's a nice synergy there, you know? Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the feature and I'm so glad to have learned this story and to have gotten to talk to you today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys. Um, and I'm looking forward, if anyone's interested in, in more Italian Jewish stories, I recommend checking out Thou Shalt Not Hate, which is also screening at our festival. It's fabulous, um, it's you haven't seen it, it's so good. Oh, you've seen it? Yeah, I think I saw, I think I saw it. In another share a distributor. What's that? Oh yeah, you we share, share a distributor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do that. Do um, that. Yeah, it's, it's it's amazing to have two Italian films in in the festival this year. So it's it's wonderful. Yeah. for anyone who's, who's a, learning. We did a Zoom call together, and it's oh, it's fabulous. You got to see it. So good. Double recommendation there, yes, and tell your friends to check out Syndrome K as well. And thank you again, Stephen. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon, and Back we hopefully you. will have you here in Boston and. And have Bella in the audience, your daughter. Right, and she will she will lead the lead the charge. Great. All right. Have a great afternoon, and we will see you all tonight at seven thirty for our conversation about they ain't ready for me. Also a Neil film. Nice. Okay. <laughs> all right. Have a good night. Thank Bye. you, guys. Cheers. <laughs>